Baptist Church. Welcome, and uh, if you didn't recognize me, I, I got a little bit of a haircut. Uh, so, I don't know if that was obvious, or, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I still look good? <laughs> well, would you bow your heads and pray with me today? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time that you've gathered us here to worship you. Um, pray that uh, as we move into, move into this time of worship, that we, would be, um, that we would open our hearts to hear what you have to say to us today as uh, Rick preaches and as we hear your word. I pray that it would be... Uh, I pray that it would impact each and every one of our lives. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and continue singing with us? sound. There we go. I threw off our sound guy. Lord, I come. I confess. Bowing here, I find my Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Runs deep, your grace is more. 
Amen. You may be seated. I'll tell you guys the same as I told the first service. Let's just get the black sweater joke over with now. <laughs> I thought, well. And then they said, Dakota wore a black sweater. Or sweater. Now you're wearing a sweater. And I said, well, I don't, I don't know about that, but uh, seems to be something that Mitch does. So this kind of grows on you a little bit. Why he wears a sweater in the middle of summer, I have no idea, because it's roasting. But anyhow, I was asked if I would read this real quick. It says, Pastor Mitch in Valparaiso Baptist Church, we want to give our most sincere thanks to our church family for the beautiful flowers and all of the support, love, kind words, and prayers during this time of loss since the passing of my mom, our children's grandma, Karen Sefton. Thank you, Pastor Mitch, for the beautiful funeral service. And thank you to the kitchen ministry for the wonderful funeral dinner afterward. Thank you to everyone who has shared stories and memories of mom with us. I love knowing that she touched so many people. And I'm so thankful that my mom loved her Lord and Savior. And we have the promise of all being together again one day. Please continue to keep our family in your prayers as we move forward and try to find our new sense of normal in our absence. Also, thank you to the Sisters of Christ for the lovely, comforting blankets. We love you all very much. Loving Christ, John, Rachel, Ray Lynn, and George Brubaker. Amen. Also, Mitch asked me to give you guys one plug real quick, so I'm going to do that. Um, remember, this Wednesday is our first family night uh, from 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, if you have not registered, please go to valpobaptist.org and do so if you're planning on coming so that we can make sure we've got enough food for everybody, okay? And that's this Wednesday night from 6 to 8 p.m., all right? Let's go ahead and pray, and we'll get into the Word. <laughs> Father, thank you. Thank you for allowing us to open our eyes and just see the beauty of your creation once more. Lord, thank you for allowing us to come into here, your house, and allowing us to worship you at the utmost level that we can. Father, I pray as we look at your word that you might take the words that we're about to hear and apply them, just a nugget, Lord, apply to each one of our lives personally so that we can take them out into the surrounding communities and apply them there as well. Amen. Be with Mitch today, Kelly and Hannah as they're away. Father, I pray that you give him the rest that he needs. I pray that you help him to enjoy his time while he's there. Family time, Lord. And Lord, I pray when he comes back, he's ready to jump back into it and just ready to blaze the trail that you set before him. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this morning, I want to touch on a topic that we all deal with, even if we don't want to admit it as a Christian. It's something that can be really alarming, and if we let it get out of control, it can get the better of us. And what I'm referring to is those struggles from within us that trip us up, and they leave us stranded out there in a world of sin. I want to quote something from Mitch that he preached back in 2021. He preached a Colossians series, and he said this, we all struggle throughout this life. It's a constant battle that goes on and on and on and on. And I want to try this morning to give us a little better idea of who we are in Jesus Christ and why those struggles can be overcome. Amen. So if you've got your Bibles, 
Turn with me this morning to Colossians chapter 3. We're going to read the first 11 verses. I like this better. The first service I heard, no pages moving. (laughs) Michael made sure. Oh, by the way, I almost didn't recognize you when I walked in the door this morning. I thought somebody put an imposter up here. So it looks good, though, buddy. Starting in verse 1. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth, for you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanliness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all in all. Now let's face it, folks. According to this passage, there's a lot of things we need to do without, right? Right? Fornication, uncleanliness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. We're told also to keep clear of these things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Don't lie to one another. Since you have put off the old man with his deeds. But your question might be, how? How do we put all this off? I mean, if we're honest with ourselves, I'm sure we would have to admit of dealing with one of these things listed here on a weekly or maybe even daily basis. And the grief that comes with those things, let's face it, it seems to intensify the stress levels in our lives. So let's kind of break this down for the next few minutes and let's just see how God would want us to see this passage. First, we have to go back to the time in which Paul wrote this passage. Now I want you to think about this. In the pagan religions of Paul's time, they said little or nothing about personal morality. A worshiper could go bow before an idol, put his money on the altar, and then go back to living the same exact life as if they were before they ever walked in the door. You see, what a person would have believed back then had no relationship whatsoever in which the way they behaved. And even more, no one would condemn that person for the way that they were living. Listen, I want to tell you what the Christian faith brought in. You see, it brought a whole new concept or idea to the pagan society. And that idea was this. What a Christian believed was also how a Christian should be living or behaving. There's a connection there between the two. I want you to think of it this way. Faith in Christ What does that mean? It means to be united with Christ. And once you choose to follow him, folks, that includes following his example. His spirit cannot live in us and permit us to continue to live in sin. So what does Paul concentrate on here? 
His desire is to explain to us the relationship between the Christian and Jesus Christ. So let's look at that. You see, Paul takes and he turns his thoughts toward a more positive aspect of Christian living here in the first few verses. It's all about one's values, which within the Christian should be rooted at conversion. And it includes a radical change of one's mind that allows us to produce that desire for separation from this sinful world. In a spiritual but almost real sense, at conversion, a Christian makes the choice to leave behind the world and its loves. And their focus is redirected now to a new domain where Christ lives. Which then brings us to a new understanding. Now Paul uses a distinct word here in the opening verses of chapter 3. In verse 3, Paul says this, For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. You died. That's a pretty powerful statement when you think about it. And there's a number of verses between chapter 2 and chapter 3 of Colossians to add to the powerful impact of that image. Folks, Paul did not spend his life burying the dead man that he left on the road to Damascus. Nor did he celebrate his memory with floods of tears. No. What he did was this. He boldly turned his back on that old man, that old life, once and for all, so that the new life that had come into him had room for growth and ultimate glory. Because we are in Christ through the work of the Holy Spirit. As 1 Corinthians 12, 13 teaches, then we have died with Christ. And that's exciting. Do you want to know why? I'll tell you. Because now we can have victory over the sin nature that wants to so badly control our lives. Listen, it does no good if Christians are willing to declare and defend the truth but they're not willing to demonstrate it in their everyday lives. You see, there are some who will defend it at the drop of a hat, but their personal life, it fails to demonstrate it. They deny the doctrines they profess to love. Give me one second, I'm about ready to cough on you guys. Titus 1.6 teaches this. Listen. They profess to know God, but in works they deny him. Being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. You see, we should be seeking the heavenly, folks. We have all died to, as Christ has died too. Just as we are all raised to all Christ is raised to. Listen, do you understand what that means? It means that the power which Jesus Jesus raised you with and he was raised from, that power is ours too. It means the power belongs to us also. You see, Christ died for us as our substitution. Just as likewise, we died with him. And that's our identification. So we must live out in practice what has already happened in fact. How many of you remember Mickey Rooney? Now don't be dating yourself, guys. For those of you who don't know who Mickey Rooney is, he was a famous actor. 
And one time in a television interview, which most times Rooney was crass, crude, often drunk in such appearances, usually angry or insulting, the interviewer knew something was different about him. So he asked Rooney about his past, and this is what Mickey said. I don't mean to sound ecclesiastical, but recently I gave my life to the Lord Jesus Christ, and now my past is gone. Amen. So you see, we're dead, and we're alive at the same time. Let me share with you a quote that I read while studying for this message from Warren Wiersbe. Life is what you're alive to. A child may come alive when you talk about a baseball game or an ice cream cone. A teenager may come alive when you mention cars or dates. Paul wrote, for me to live is Christ. Christ was Paul's life. And he was alive to anything that related to Christ. Amen. So should it be with every believer. Amen. You see, we must realize also that we're raised in Christ. Amen. In verse 1, Paul uses the word if. Please understand that that in no way would suggest that we might have not been raised with Christ. For all of us are identified with Christ in his death, his burial, resurrection, and ascension. Amen. So in this, we become a new person with Christ. You see, when Jesus gave us life, he lifted us out of the grave and seated us at the throne in heaven. Christ is at the right hand of the Father, and we are seated there in Christ. Paul reminds us in 2 Corinthians 5.17 that we're a new creation. Listen to this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That newness within you is because you're raised with Christ in like-mindedness. Our position in Christ is not a hypothetical thing, nor is it as a goal for which we strive. Christian, you can know with certainty that it is an accomplished fact. Amen. You see, we need to also realize that we're hidden in Christ as well. Because we have died and were raised with him, folks, we no longer belong to this world. Amen. We belong to Jesus Christ. Amen. And our sources of life should only come from him now. Yes. You want security and satisfaction in your life? Well, that's exactly what being hidden in Christ will get you. You see, the Christian life is a hidden life in Christ. Where the world is concerned, it doesn't bother them because they don't know who Christ is. They don't know of his ways. Heaven is where our motives and our strengths should come from, not this world. We also need to know that we're glorified in Christ. How many of you know what the definition of glorify is? Let me share it from Merriam-Webster real quick. To make glorious by bestowing honor, praise, or admiration. To elevate to celestial glory. To give glory to as in worship. Now, what does it mean to be glorified in Christ. According to Warren Wiersbe, Christ is now seated at the Father's right hand. But one day he will come to take his people home. And when he does, we shall enter into eternal glory with Christ. 
when he is revealed in his glory, we shall also be revealed in glory. According to the Apostle Paul, we have already been glorified. Romans 8.30 says this, Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. You see, this glory simply has not yet been revealed. Christ has already given us the glory, according to John 17, 22. Amen. Listen to this. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, Amen. that they may be one just as we are one. But the full revelation of the glory awaits the return from the Savior. Now, that's some information to hold on to. Folks, it's alarming how fast things are changing in this world today. It's also alarming on how it seems that Christians are willing to say they'll defend the gospel, how they'll, they'll, they'll defend the truth, but how they are pulling away from living out the truth daily. So I wanted to share some thoughts with you this morning. You see, it's our responsibility to remember that identification that we have in Christ. While remembering that it's our job to seek the things from above. Not here in this world. Thanks to Christ's death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, we are now separated from our old way of life. Amen. And I stated that earlier. But how many people actually walked away from their old life at conversion? You might have this to think about. How is it that I am supposed to seek things from above? Here's an idea. It's found right in our text today. Look at Colossians 3.2 again. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. It's right in front of our face. Think about heavenly things, not the things of this world. And even though we're planted here in this world for now, we must concentrate on the things from above. Dr. Wiersbe says this one last time. It means that practical, everyday affairs of life get their direction from Christ in heaven. It means further that we look at earth from heaven's point of view and not our own values. It's all about your values, folks. And here's the deal. Sin doesn't come from the hand, the eye, or the foot. Rather, it comes from within. It comes from your heart. And Paul does his best to warn us of those sins by specifically naming them to us. And you see, some people don't like that because it forces us to face the truth. The sins that Paul named here in this passage, they belong to the old life. They don't belong to your new one in Christ. And they have no place in this new life. Remember this, God's judgment falls on those who practice these sins. And God is no respecter of persons. And his judgment will come again. Yeah. Colossians 3, 6 says, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons 
of disobedience. So if I could be of an encouragement to you this morning, then let me encourage you in this area. If you were to closely examine your life, if you were to realize that you are one of those who are a believer, and in your mind would take a stand for what is right, but you're not willing to defend the truth, might I encourage you today to spend some time in prayer with your heavenly father and straighten this situation out once and for all. And folks, once you straighten it out, don't ever look back. Walk away from those sins because they're strapping you into a life that the world loves. Fornication, uncleanliness, passion, Evil desire and covetousness, which is idolatry, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. I'm going to close with this statement. Don't allow yourself to be a chameleon. One who changes their colors to fit in whatever situation you're in, regardless good or bad of a situation. Don't be afraid to model what the Christian brought into the pagan societies. And here's what faith brought. It's a whole new concept or idea into the pagan society. What a Christian believed is also how a Christian should be living as well as behaving question I have for you this morning to think about is have you let go of your old life let's pray thank you Lord thank you for the opportunity of just being here this morning Lord I pray as we opened up the words of your book Father, I pray that if there's someone here today that is closely looking over their life, Father, and they see that, you know what, I fit that mold. I am that chameleon. Lord, what I pray right now for them is that they'll come to you on their knees and they'll get right with the creator of all. Father, help us in the time coming. Might your will be done here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Folks, the altar is open this morning. If you'll stand. This time now is between you and God.
You can be seated. Is Dakota here? Dakota is not here, so give me one second and I'll pull up the announcements really quick. Okay, so join us this Saturday at 9 a.m., guys. 